Um, but anyway, so I'd like to introduce uh, the three inspiring women that have joined us tonight. And so I'm going to start from the far end, and mostly that's because I'm going to pronounce your name right. Um, she is a visual artist who created the Stop Telling Women to Smile campaign. Her name is Tatiana Fazla Lizade. I got it right. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, next to her is Rakia Reynolds, who is an entrepreneur, founder, and CEO of Sky Blue Media. And then to my right is JavaScript developer and CEO of Jewelbots, Sarah Cherries. So ladies, welcome to the panel. <laughs> so first off, I want to start off by asking all of you, because one of the things that I found so interesting and so amazing about all of your stories is that all of you have had this point in your lives and your career when something spoke to you internally and personally that said, you know what, you need to go and do your own thing. And so many of us as women sometimes have learned to ignore that voice or to dismiss it or something and just keep doing whatever treachery that we're doing. But how did you find the strength to break out and do your own thing, to pursue your own business? So um, I'm an artist, I'm a visual artist, a painter. Um, and, and so to be an artist kind of forces me to think outside of the box and to um, be as creative as I possibly can. I went to school for illustration, um, and since then, I am an illustrator, but I also do multiple things. I do public art, um, I you know, am a traditional oil painter, I do illustration work still, um, and at some point, I just kind of allow myself the space to just be creative and do what I needed to do to speak to the audiences that I needed to speak to. So a lot of my work is about sexual harassment, about gender, about race, um, and about confronting these things in our society and how women are treated, how women of color are treated, how black folks are treated. Um, and in order to do that, I did have to say, you can use your voice, you can use your experience, and you can use that in your artwork. Um, and you don't have to be afraid to go against um, societal norms and to speak out against these oppressions in your artwork. Um, and I guess that was a conscious choice to, to do that. Um, but how it's done and what it looks like, whether that's you know a painting that's done in the street or done in my studio or done online, um, I do that based upon just the audience that I'm trying to reach and who I'm trying to affect and the impact that I'm trying to have. Um, and I have to do that. I have to make those choices every day about going and doing what it is that I want to do and not being afraid to do what I want to do. I have to make that decision every day as an artist. Um, because it's difficult being an artist, but I can imagine. Yeah, but it, I, but I, I'm good at it and I love it, and um, there's really nothing else that I, I want to be doing. Um, so yeah, you know, it's a decision that I made a long time ago, and also a decision that I make on a daily basis. The art that I make and the type of art that I make. So I think like some a lot of entrepreneurs, we create out of necessity. And I always say that I created my business through a series of unfortunate events. Um, I was a television producer and a magazine producer. And when television started to, you know, sort of mess with the way that, you know, I thought about things or the way it sort of, it was against sort of my ethos and, and my standard of beliefs. Um, and then magazines were, you know, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so I was, I was laid off from a production that I was really excited to be working on and it was then, I, was, I had one child, I was married, and I was pregnant with my second child. And that's probably one of the, the, the scariest moments when you're pregnant with your second child, your family is growing and you're like, okay, so what do I do now? Like for me, it was like, what do I do now? What do I do, what, what do, I do now? And I remember being brought into this room with all of these people and they were like, you know, uh, in two weeks, everybody's gonna be laid off. If you can't move to LA to work on this big production, and at that time I was pregnant and you know my family was growing, and I said, there's no way that I can up and leave to LA, so I'm, I'm gonna have to take this whole, like, I'm gonna be laid off. And I was on unemployment, and I had this moment where I said, 
I don't want to eat tuna fish and peanut butter and jelly for the rest of my life. Like, no, literally, it was like down to that. Like, my husband was in graduate school, and we were like looking at oatmeal packets. Like, okay, maybe we'll have this for dinner tonight. And for me, it was like, there's no way that I am this smart and that I've navigated my way through life this far to fail. And I believe that, you know, leaning in and failure and all of those things pushing you forward, but when you have to pay the bills, when you need a, an income to make it, you are a by any means necessary type of person. And for me, it was like, use all of the talents that God gave you. Like, you're a television producer, you're a magazine producer, you have the gift of gab, like, take all those things and really make something of it. And for me, it was like, okay, how do I do this and how do, how do I do this right now? And, and that's what I did. I didn't write a business plan. I didn't, you know, seek out help from anyone. It was... How do I do this and how do I do this now and how do I monetize it and how do I make this benefit my family? And so it was really like assessing myself and saying like what are all of my, you know, my attributes and what are the great things that I know about myself and my brand and how do I monetize my brand? And I decided to start a company really because my mother used to always say to me, Reiki, you cannot be on every ship that sails. I'm like, yes, I can. <laughs> I can be on every ship that sails. So I essentially created a company that allowed me to be on every ship that sailed. So taking all of the things that I learned at MTV and TLC and Discovery Health and all of those TV shows that I've worked on and producing fashion editorials for Lucky Magazine and producing web content. And, and then I created a company really encompassing all of my gifts and the things that I had done for the, the, the past three years and created a company so that I honestly, can make money. Like, that was really it. Like, how do I make money to feed, feed myself and, like, my husband who's in graduate school and this baby that's on the way? And yet still, it was your passion. It, it was, and, and I think, like, for me, it, I started off early on. I had a learning disability when I was a kid, and so I could never write full reports like the other kids. And so my father bought me a video camera when I was younger to videotape everything. And so I, I didn't know that I was a documentary filmmaker when I was a kid. I didn't know I was a producer. I just knew I was a kid that learned differently from other kids and the way that I expressed myself or the way that I handed in assignments and dating myself, I would hand in a VHS instead of a <laughs> So handing in the VHS, so it was, hey Rakia, you're a content creator and a producer you know, from starting from the fourth grade. So looking back at the things that really helped me to win in life when I was in a dark place was, it was passion, but it was like, what are, what are the things that got you through life thus far and how do you turn that, how do you turn that into something? And I think PSA for parents, for pay attention to your kids that do things a little differently. And when your kids do something a little differently, that might be a gift. So for me, it was like, what are all of the things that I've done differently in my life and those are my gifts. Those are, those are the things that made me shine. Those are the things that have directed my path. And that's how I essentially started my business. All right, Sarah, um, you have managed to thrive in a field, in the STEM field, that has been attempting to reach out to a lot of women, not always <laughs> doing the best at it. But tell me about starting your business and how was it that you found your footing in such a heavily male-dominated field? I think that's a good question. I think. Um, I think I've had a lot of mentors, both female and male mentors. Um, I think I was lucky to be surrounded by people that really wanted to make a difference in the field. Um, so, especially early in my career, uh, people giving me, uh, people becoming sponsors, you know, where they would um, themselves be provided opportunity and they would say, um, you know what, I'm gonna pass, but meet Sarah, I'm just kind of shoving me out there. And that was a really, uh, that was a really neat part of my career early on that I try to pass on now because um, I think uh So right now we are in this moment in the country where it seems like women fighting back against sexism seems to be in the zeitgeist. I'm not going to ask any of you if, I know you have dealt with it. But I'm wondering how as an independent woman working on your own as an independent contractor, business person, artist, do you push back against what seems like the constant wave of, well, sweetie, that's cute what you're doing, but it's, I don't really take it seriously? Uh, well, my work is all about that. The content of the work, um, the environment that I'm doing the work in, I 
am mostly known for being a public artist, even though I do other things. Um, and street art and public art is very much so a male-dominated field, like a lot of things are. Um, and so to be a woman, to go outside and to physically put up a piece of art on a wall um, in the streets at night usually um, is me taking back space in more than one way. Physically taking space, metaphorically taking space, and pushing back against this narrative of being a woman artist who can only do certain things. Um, and then the content of my work. My work is all about women representing their voices, um, representing their faces, um, taking what they have experienced and reflecting that back into the work, reflecting that back into the public space. So my work itself is just a bunch of women saying, this is who I am, this is me asserting myself, this is how I have been treated, but how I am not going to be treated anymore, um, how I want to be treated. And so all of those things influence everything about who I am as an artist. Um, being a woman is very much so a part of my identity as a person that influences how I am treated and therefore how I am expressing myself in my art, um, the art that I am making, and who I choose to represent in my art. Um, so yeah, it, it all works together. The work that I'm making, the space that I'm making it in, um, yeah, all of these spaces are kind of overlapping, right? So it's being a woman, being a woman artist, and saying very much so in my artwork, this is who women are and how we want to be treated. Um, so yeah, it's not just one thing for me, right? It's not just being like, um, I'm a woman artist pushing back against men who think that I can't do this, but it's me doing so in the art that I'm making and what I'm saying um, in the space that I'm choosing to create the art. It all works together for me. Yeah, I think I, I spend a lot of my time um, convincing people that uh, preteen girls are an incredible demographic that need to be served. Um, I think that when you look at the toys that we make for boys, they're all about creating and building and architecting the future. And the toys that we make for girls are all about caretaking and consuming. And it's really hard to convince people that hold the purse strings or the, the people uh, with that have the power to make your project come to fruition, that this group is a very important group to all of our future. Um, and so I think that um, when people come to that realization of, oh, wait a second, we wouldn't have Snapchat if it weren't for preteen girls, or wait a second, like no one know, would know who Leonardo DiCaprio was without preteen <laughs> girls. <laughs> um, so uh, that's maybe the one of the best parts of my job, besides hanging out with you know, 10 year olds that are um, really brilliant. Uh, I think that's kind of where a lot of my energy goes and kind of how I try to fight that is um, just giving power to this generation. I, I think one of the things that I, I'm usually, faith, you know, people usually ask me, um, you know, I, I typically sit, you know, at tables or I'm typically in rooms where, you know, people don't necessarily look like me or sound like me and, you know, I'm black. I'm very, very black. And um, I, you know, and my name's Rakia, you know, and I have an afro. And I remember growing up, my mother used to say to me, if you don't straighten your hair, you're not going to get a job. I'm like, well, damn this, then I'm probably not going to work. So, you know, now, you know, being an adult, sitting in all of these rooms, and, you know, I'm loud and proud and you know, I have an afro and it's blue and green sometimes when I don't get touch-ups. Um, and, you know, being in tables, I, you know, I, I typically get asked the question or people typically say to me, well, you're very confident. You're, and, and, it, and it's this air of like, well, you're very confident in why? And so I usually respond that, you know, well, confidence is defined by tackling a task and I've tackled many tasks. And so I'm always going to step in the room loud and proud and confident in who I am, who, whose I am, and what I do, because I can run circles around anyone in this room. And I think sometimes that's intimidating to people. When you confidently step into a place and space and say, I will run circles around you, because not because I'm articulate, but because I'm smart and I know what I'm talking about, 
and I'm creative and I can operate with the right and left side of my brain. Sometimes that's not just being a woman or being a black woman, but it's like you're intimidating to people because you operate with the right and left side of your brain. And I think when you can do that in many places and spaces, it's intimidating to people, but it's being able to go into those places and, and, and not being shy about being confident or saying, okay, maybe I'm being too braggadocious. No, it is, it's a moment in time for all women, all people to say, I'm confident because, or I'm doing this because. And, it's, and I think we're at a moment where we should proclaim the yes ands and the yes because, because we've all been through things, we all go, we, we've all been through things and we've all tackled so many tasks and it's being able to, to tell those stories in a way that inspire other people but also pave, pave the way as the trailblazers we are. I mean, all of us up here are trailblazers. We are you know, blazing the way for other people that may not have been able to do that if, they, if they've if not seen it. And I'm a mother, so I'm always speaking in, in these terms of like, what is my daughter going to think? Or you know, what is my son going to think? So it's being able to be reflective to say, how do we inspire those people by being loud and proud at all times? I'm wondering for all of you, what would you say is the hidden piece of hard work a lot of times when you see successful people come forward and they tell their story or something and it's this, you know, like came from nothing and I just worked hard and I got to wherever they got to. Um, but there's always some crucial part of the story that either conveniently or maybe unintentionally gets left out. And I'm wondering if you guys would be willing to share what that was for you. What was that, that, that nest, that, that piece of the puzzle that you had to struggle with to make sure that you kept moving forward? Um, you know, again, being an artist is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, being a visual artist in particular, um, I, every day it's, it's me trying to figure out how I am balancing a couple of things, how I am um, making a living being a professional artist while also um, being true to what it is that I want to say and express, um, while also you know feeling like I am making ways and I'm being innovative and being original, um, so it's it's a constant battle between my creative self, um, and my professional self, and then just being an adult person trying to pay bills in Brooklyn. You know, it's like all of that stuff happening at the same time. Um, you know, I. I feel like I've been lucky and that I have been able to make the art that I want to make and that it's been finding itself in front of the places and audiences that it needs to find itself in front of and I have been able to continue and be successful and be on the stage with you all. Um, but it is every day difficult doing that for a bunch of different reasons. Sometimes it's difficult just getting out of bed in the morning and feeling like I am creative and I am dope. I know that I am. Sometimes I have to tell myself that in order to get out of bed and actually do the work. Um, so it's that, right? It's, it's, I think people look at me and they think that um, I have been successful and that I'm this badass woman out here in the streets fighting the patriarchy and all of these things. And I am in a sense, but sometimes that's hard. Sometimes I'm just a woman who just wants to um, get through the day, you know, um, and try to make something that I think is good. Uh, whenever I go to my studio, I'm just trying to get through that day in the studio. What can I make here today that is good, that is dope, that I feel good about? Um, and then go home. Um, and that isn't this huge thing that's not taking over the world, that's not changing the world, that's simply me getting through the day and making something that's good. Um, and again, doing that here in Brooklyn, trying to pay rent. Um, so it's <laughs> really nothing to say. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but you know, those are the some well, of the let me challenges. Phrase it this that way, because um, for example, uh, I've done mentoring, and so if you meet young women who want to be, you know, artists or business women or journalists or something like that, it's not just pursuing that dream. It's also networking. It's also getting out there and making sure that you are part of a larger community. It's, there's more to it than just pursuing that one dream. And I guess that's what I was trying to get at, yeah. is that what are some of those ancillary things that you might not think are part of you know, being a street artist, and yet at the same time, 
you wouldn't maybe have not gotten some of the recognition that you did had you not met this person who mentioned this to that person and then suddenly you're in a magazine. Yeah, well, I mean, networking is huge. That's what I realized when I moved to New York is that you can't just be a talented artist, you have to also be social and networking and being out and talking to people and shaking people's hands and all of that, um, which I'm not the greatest at sometimes. I, I, you know, I don't feel like doing it, you know? <laughs> I don't want to be social, I don't want to be talking. Um, but that is a part of it. It is making relationships and having relationships with people and collaborating, which is also a huge thing that I've um, come to as an artist, is that uh, I can't just be making this stuff up by myself. I want to work with other artists. I want to work with my peers. I want to work with organizations and institutions. And that does require building relationships. Um, so yeah, it's not just the talent. It's not just the work itself, the physical artwork. It is all these other things. It is the relationships. It is talking to people. Um, it is promotion and all of that stuff, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, you become an artist and that's just something you realize. That's just something that, that happens, you know. It's not something that I think you have to tell someone who wants to be an artist. They'll, they'll figure that out. Um, yeah. And I, I, think, I also think that, you know, it's, it's realizing that, you know, we often, because of social media, we often, you know, get lost in lights and uh, we have to be a fan of our own brand. So it is being able to say, like, let me immerse myself in who I am and be able to understand what I'm, what I'm offering. I think, you know, in addition to networking and all the other things that go into, you know, building you as a person, it's not just, you know, to, to, to go back to your original point, it's not just, you know, this trajectory of success. It's being able to put all of the pieces together and me being able to have your work speak for itself. I always tell my team, like, we're as good as our last project, we're as great as our last campaign, we're as good as our last commercial. And there have been so many times, you know, in, in my professional life where it's like, man, I made a mistake, but that mistake really wasn't something that was a mistake. That was something that really opened the door for something else. One of my favorite quotes is, let your setbacks be a setup for a really great comeback. And I feel like I've had major comebacks because I've had setbacks and I've had failures and I've like turned down the, the wrong roads, but it's like, okay, you've not really turned down the wrong roads. It's, you know, a, another road that has opened for you. I remember a huge corporation wanted to buy my company and I was like, something in my gut was like, I don't really want to sell right now. And people were like, you're dumb. Like, take the money, you're poor. You should take all the money that they're trying to give you. And I was like, something's not right. But had I taken the money and gone with this corporation, they really just wanted me to, you know, sometimes when people want to buy your company, they just want you to work for them. And if I would have gone to work for them, I would have never, you know, three weeks after I had made that decision to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I got a call from Serena Williams and her team to say, hey, how can you work with us? How can you work with our brand? And then started working with really cool people like Ashley Graham and, you know, working with technology companies like Dell. Now, had I sold out in the very, very beginning, I would have missed out on all of those opportunities because I would have sold out and cut myself short. So it's being, it's really essentially, really, and, and it sounds so cliche, but really putting all of the emphasis on what it is that you're doing and your personal brand and being a fan of your own brand. Yeah, I think the thing that makes me uh, strong as a technologist is to be able to go into a situation and start with, okay, here's how, here's what could go wrong right here. And like, here are all the things that are going to go wrong, and here's what we're going to do to make sure they don't go wrong. And here is how we're going to make sure um, that this project is successful. Turns out that's not how you start conversations with investors. <laughs> 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 and so it took me a while to figure out, oh, okay, I, I need to be telling a story and not being like, all right, here's how we're going to make sure this goes great. <laughs> uh, so I think that was probably the biggest challenge is, you know, uh, having technical background and thinking about the best technology to be built for the situation. Um, that's important, but what's more important is you can tell people, here's what we're doing related to their lives and, um, you know, have, you know, get them to the point of, oh my goodness, this change that needs to happen. How do I help? You know, one of the things that I'm hearing from all three of you is the crucial importance of knowing yourself and being comfortable with yourself. And I'm wondering if that was something that you already had when you 
began your journey, or was that something that your journey brought out of you? Yeah, I did not have that. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely something that has developed over time. Um, yeah, I've always been trying to find who am I, who is my voice, what is my voice, what am I trying to say, what is my purpose being an artist? Um, I think that I have come to that now. I feel like I'm in a good space. I think that I will surely evolve and change and maybe eventually um, my goals and intent and the intent with my work will change over time. But right now, I feel like I know what I'm doing. Um, but it did take me a while to get there, you know? I was just trying to make work, make work, make work, and then find myself through making that work. Um, and over the past few years, I have found that for me, it's not just the piece of art that I'm making. Um, it is being useful to communities, being making work that is useful to people, um, making work that has an effect on people, um, and that's not just for myself. Um, work that is not just for self-expression, but is of use. Um, and in doing that, I have kind of crossed this bridge where I'm now into this artist activist space, and I'm okay with that. Um, that wasn't my goal at first, you know, I'm just, an, I want to make good art. But now I'm in a place where I am making art that is actually doing something and hopefully contributing to changing society and changing our culture. And that feels good. And so moving forward, um, I know that that's the type of art that I want to continue to make. What the art looks like will potentially change, but I think the intent of making the art and the themes and the messages, right now I feel like I have a strong idea of what that is, and I want to continue with that. But it did take me a while to get there. Um, I realized that who I am as a person matters a lot to me. So my personal experience, being a woman, being a black woman, putting that into my artwork is very important now, when it wasn't before, but now it is. Um, and it took me years to get there, but um, it feels good to know that now. Um, I nestled, I don't give my real age out, but I nestled, snuggled, and wrecked in my late 30s, and um, nestled. And I think that, you know, I didn't really know who I was until I was like in my early 30s. And for, you know, those of you who, you know, have children, you sometimes get lost. Like, and there's, you know, people say, oh, you bounce back right afterwards, three months, and no, for me, you know, I had three children, so every child, it took me a year to sort of get back into myself and to really understand, you know, who, who I was at the moment because you're, you're breastfeeding and you're not yourself. You're, 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 a, you're an object. You're, you're feeding someone else off of your body and you're constantly giving yourself up. So I know that, you know, started, I started having children at 24 and, and my last one, at 30 and it was like I lost myself time and time and time again I lost myself when I got married I lost myself when I had children I lost myself when I started my business I lost myself when you know I got into work and when I be started to become a successful entrepreneur I, I sought out validation from other people like oh you're successful and there wasn't a time when I said oh Rekia you're successful you're doing a great job I sought that validation out from other people, whether it was, you know, people on, on my advisory board, whether it was clients, but when you can get to a point when you're not seeking out validation from someone else, that's your wake up moment. That's where you're, you've, you've sort of, you're in that stage where you're like, you're woke and you're like, okay, I know who I am and I know what my purpose is and I know what I'm here to do. And, and sometimes it doesn't happen until later on in life. And for me, I'll be honest, it didn't happen uh, really, until I was like my early to mid thirties. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, I think that the thing uh, I think we're always getting to know ourselves. I think that's kind of what life is about, right? Learning who you are, what your limits are. You know, what won't shut you down. But um, and so uh, I think that that's been a really big part of my education figuring that out and continues to be. I almost feel guilty asking this question. And the reason why I feel guilty is because it is never ever proposed to men. But as inspiring women, how do you find balance, personal and professional balance in your lives? 
You know, being an artist, my life is being an artist. It's not something that I separate. It's, it's, it's difficult to separate being an artist in my profession um, from my personal life. You know, I wake up at whatever time I wake up and I'm working for the rest of the day. You know, I could wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning, but I'm still working at 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, and my personal life, it just kind of interweaves. Um, and again, going back to what I was just saying, I think that using my personal experience in my artwork um, also is, there's not really a separation there. Um, one thing that I am trying to do is figure out how to step away from, you know, all of the very serious things that I talk about in my work in order to kind of take care of myself and to make sure that I'm good and able to do this work. Um, the work that I do, is physically intensive, emotionally intensive, mentally intensive. Um, and so I do have to step back and take time to kind of recharge, to refresh, um, to get away from everything, to make sure that I'm good so that I can actually continue this work. Um, but I'm taking everything from my personal life and I'm putting it into my artwork from, you know, walking down the street and somebody catcalling me to um, being in love to, you know, my family relationships, all of these things um, influence the work that I make. So this kind of blurry line, um, but where I do try to draw the line is when I need to kind of step back and take care of myself. Self-care is incredibly important. I don't want to dismiss that at all. That is huge. Well, I ain't even gonna lie on this stage <laughs> to y'all tonight. No, I, I mean, I do try, but it's, it's hard. I, so Takesha works with me. She manages my schedule. So she's shaking her head right now um, because she doesn't, she gets very upset with my schedule. And, you know, I, I look at it like, to be honest, there, I've not even answered that question for myself. I would love to find true balance. But for me, it's like I'm constantly juggling things, right? So everything to me is a pin. There's a wife pin, there's the entrepreneur pin, there's the mom pin, there's the leader pin, there are all of these pins. And every day I'm gonna drop a pin, every day. If I get, if I've missed ballet practice, I've dropped the mom pin. If I've snapped on my husband, I've dropped the wife pin. If I've not really assessed someone right, like correctly in my company, I've dropped the leadership pin and I've dropped the entrepreneurship pin. But every day I know that I am not able to hold and juggle. Like I'm not a great juggler. I'm not able to jug, juggle and catch all of those pins. What I, what I have done is I've been able to accept that the pin that I drop on that given day, I'm okay with that. And I can apologize for that. I was if, gonna ask how you deal with the guilt issue. I, I apologize. I, I, I've learned to apologize for things. If I've been short tempered with my 14 year old for, for catching an attitude with me, I apologize to her. You know what, I'm sorry. I make mistakes too. And I'm short tempered with you because I'm tired. And she might understand that. Or if I've walked into to an office and I've slammed, you know, some of my staff says, oh, you, when you get mad, you slam your hand on the desk. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I've slammed my hand on the desk today. I, listen, it's not just you. I'm stressed out. Like, this client did something and it snowballed and it, it made me mad and I shouldn't have slammed my hand on the, on the desk at you. And sometimes to my husband, I, I, I found that I'm very apologetic now, later on in life, you know, it snuggled in my 30s. I am sorry that I yelled at you. It wasn't about you, I am tired. So I know that I have my limits. I know that I can't operate off of four hours of sleep anymore. I used to, but now I have to have seven hours of sleep. So to me, that's my balance, knowing that you know, there are certain things that I shouldn't be eating. There are certain things that I shouldn't be wearing because it might affect that I'm not comfortable. I can't wear heels like I used to wear before. It's like being in a place where I'm completely comfortable and not just outwardly, but being comfortable enough to say, shit, I made a mistake and I am sorry because it, it might not just be you, but it might be me because I didn't get enough sleep or because I can't deal with things like everybody deals with it. So I, I don't... I think sometimes when people ask me the question of balance, I don't believe in I don't I don't believe in it, and I could be completely wrong. I think that we all have shit, like a lot of shit, and, and especially people that work and you know who are. And I, again, I'm a working mother. I have to work. I tell my kids, you know, we live in Princeton, New Jersey, so we live in the suburbs, and a lot of the moms, 
are doing yoga at 10 a.m. and they get to pick their kids up after school and do all of these things. And my kids are like, well, why did you miss this? And I'm like, because I gotta work. I have to work, like you wanna go to lacrosse and ballet and you wanna be in the Jack and Jill program and you wanna be in all these things. Well, in order for those things to happen, I have to work. And that might, that might mean that it will take away from me sitting down with you after school. It might take away from me having those special moments in the morning where I'm looking in the mirror at you. So it's not about balance. I mean, I mean, sorry. Okay. But like, it's not just about balance, but it's being able to deal with the stuff that you just can't do because not everybody can do, not everybody can do everything. That's very well put. <laughs> I want that on a button. I don't think you do everything. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think the balance, there is no such thing as balance. Like, who's balanced? Have you met anyone? I've never met anyone and been like, wow, you really, I don't know, people, um, you watch television sometimes. I think people on TV are balanced, but um, not scripted. Yeah, they're scripted that way. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think that having a supportive partner is something that changed my life. Like having so, you know someone to go through life with that is your cheerleader and um, is not your um, yeah just not doesn't feel emasculated doesn't need to compete doesn't you know I think that was something that was very important to me and I think um, that helps me have something sanity if not balance 